Hi, Eric. Hi, Aaron. How's it going? Pretty good. People can't see us, but uh, if you could, you would wonder if we were having a hair growing contest. <laughs> That's right. That's true. <laughs> uh, it's driving uh, my wife crazy. Oh, yeah. And not in a good way. <laughs> my wife has said that um, it has grown out to a stage where it's attractive, but it's not lasting. So don't get attached to it. So bit Bill, of a mixed message. There. We had a ward member in our Zoom church recently plead to all the men. She said, don't cut your pandemic hair. Wear it back to church so I can see it. Do you remember? Oh, I know. I missed that. Yeah. I must have tuned in too late or left too early or something. <laughs> So I have to, uh, I have to leave it grown out. I mean, that's have just to leave the rules. it for at least that long. That's right. Well, okay. Um, so tweener sewed. Yes. Uh, I, you know, our fun, our season finale is shaping up to be a bit more work than we anticipated. So we thought we'd dive away from our normal, our season three topic. We're not going to talk about David Omoke or even maybe even the rise of more modern Mormonism. <laughs> <laughs> Not precisely. But instead, we're going to talk about a, a thing, a bit of news, you know, a, news. a bit of near and dear to our hearts. That's mostly been resolved by now. But it caused quite the kerfuffle for the last over the last month. It did. Yeah. And in my opinion, quite appropriately so. Okay, so we're going to talk about Minerva Tykart. Why don't you start there, and then we'll jump to a bit about the Manti Temple, and we're going to talk about its murals and how they almost left the temple. But talk. I'm going to start be, with Minerva. No, I'm going to be completely disobedient. Go further back in time. Oh, okay, great. So uh, before Minerva, who is like awesome, she's like the root and tunist, uh, ranch running, painting woman. Like her story is fascinating. She's she's so cool. Um, but before her, she was not the first like fine artist in the church. In fact, in the early Utah days, missionaries were sent on art missions to France um, to learn how to paint naked ladies in landscape so they could come back and bring good art to the church. And um, which is awesome, right? Like uh, that's the church, the early church by the early church. I mean, like the Brigham Young era church was totally into having good art it because art is an important part of being a culture and one of the things that Brigham Young and the Brigham Young era leadership was very into was the concept of building a culture to the point where they would do things like um, creating their own alphabet so that the, with the idea that eventually the saints would only be able to read stuff that had been approved for the Latter-day Saint culture and one one likes to imagine, Aaron, like what if what if the U.S. government had, hadn't come tromping in so soon? What if we'd had another 50 or 70 years to just be weirdo Mormons before um, all that changed? I'm, gonna, I'm looking anyway, at the um, Brigham Young alphabet because I've heard about it. Oh, the Deseret alphabet. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's uh, it was very trendy at the time, actually. There are a lot of phonetic alphabets that were bouncing up at that time. I remember going to because I was a weirdo at the BYU library going down into the periodicals in the basement of the library and reading some period uh, magazines that were published in in um, in various phonetic alphabets but it's a, it's a stupid it's a stupid thing like yes English is weird with its spelling but but the weirdness of the spelling also has function and there's so many downsides to a phonetic alphabet that uh, anyway, that's a different episode for a totally different podcast. Oh, but I'm so um, excited and interested in it. I want to hear everything oh, you so were about to say about. Yeah, like. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, it's, okay, it's fine. great. But I mean, the important part, the, the relevant part here is that um, the Brigham Young era saints were really interested in forming a coherent and separate culture that was Latter day Saint culture that was separate from American culture that was separate from any other culture in the world. And. Um, and maybe if they'd been left alone a little bit longer, that would have really happened. I mean, as it is, we do have our own culture, but it's not as separate from, say, American culture as it might be, which uh, would have been a heck of a lot more interesting. Okay. So anyways, you have these early art missionaries. Um, and oh, like one, I, for instance. Sorry, oh, I just oh, have, I, oh. I don't think I've heard of these art missionaries before. Oh, well, they're it's pretty cool, right? The more, so, we, the more uh, we do the show the more stuff I find out about the church that I just had no idea about. And I keep thinking that surely, surely I've reached, I've learned it all. 
and uh, <laughs> you keep bringing up new stuff. Okay, so art missionaries, tell me I more. Like so they went to we France. We were talking, they went to France, yeah, to, um, for the sole purpose of um, learning how to do art in the best way possible. And that's why you go to France. That's the center of the art world at the time. And and um, that's that's pretty great, right? So they they go there and they do they study under masters. So you have someone like John Hafen, who is one of these, and is generally I don't know if generally is fair, but he's often considered to be considered. Uh, he's often considered to be considered. Let, let let me stop waffling so much and say he's. Most people would agree that he's he's the greatest of the art missionaries. Okay. Um, and he actually does some murals in the Manti Temple, so he's relevant to the conversation we're having. Um, he also did some murals in the Salt Lake Temple, which were destroyed um, earlier this year or late last year. I'm not actually sure when that happened. Mm -hmm. um, John Hafen um, does the very first visual image of Heavenly Mother, which is kind of relevant to stuff we've talked about on the show before. That's excellent. Um, I will provide you a link so you can uh, share. What he did was he, he did a... Um, a, uh, he did an illustrated version of Eliza Snow's famous poem that we call Oh My Father nowadays in the hymn book. And it includes the Heavenly Mother um, drawing that he did. Um, if you give me a little extra time, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm looking at this 1988 Ensign article entitled uh, Harvesting the Light, the 1890 Paris Art Mission. And it has a section on these guys that you're mentioning, including... Um, John Hafen, and there's some, and there's a bunch of their art is here in this article. Okay, so we'll have that. But, we'll have a pamphlet in the uh, show notes. Yes, it'll be cool. You'll all like it. Um, but so, so the art missionaries, first of all, they're supposed to learn art. Second of all, they're supposed to bring it back and paint awesome stuff. But also, they're supposed to teach the the next generation of how to be great artists, right? And um, I'm actually, I don't know off the top of my head whether Minerva Teichart studied under one of them, but it, it seems extremely likely. Um, I wanna say she studied under Hafen, but I, I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, okay, so anyway, so Minerva Teichart is part of a, a, a later generation. And um, she is, like I said, she is, um, there is, there's a six letter word, Aaron, that um, rhymes, with no hang on i don't want to say what it rhymes with but it starts with bad and ends with a double s and it is <laughs> it, this is one of the most appropriate times it could ever be used because that is minerva tycart she's so fascinating she's like um she runs a ranch she has all these kids she's so busy and she puts her kids through byu by trading paintings for their education and she's an excellent excellent painter um she's probably i would wager the most widely known and respected Latter-day Saint artist. Uh, she once explained, I don't know if that's quantifiable, but here, sorry. Wiki, this Wiki, Wikipedia thing here. She once explained, I must paint when asked about how she persisted in painting despite being in near complete art, artistic isolation without a dedicated studio or even much free time to create. Yeah, and there she is living in Cokeville, Wyoming, which have you been to Cokeville, Aaron? I have not. <laughs> well, neither has anyone else. <laughs> um, I have, but that puts me in a very rare company. At the 2010 census, there were 535 people living there. That's mm -hmm. where she lived most of her life. Okay. Um, and I mean, she did study in New York, and um, and I don't, I don't like I said, I don't know if she studied under any of the art missionaries, but she did study in New York among some some people who were known at the time. Um, but art is what she did. That was that was her soul. And it was not something that people around her necessarily understood. I grew up not far from Cokeville. Um, and I, I do not want to be interpreted as denigrating my uh, hometown or anything, but uh, not people who necessarily are noted for their appreciation of the fine arts. Um, there were some paintings that she did. I believe it was for the Tabernacle in Montpelier, though I could be wrong. Uh, that were damaged somehow, I don't remember, in a flood or, or a fire or something. And they just sort of cut them up, cut it up, cut up what was left and sent them to her. And she was heartbroken because she had poured her soul into those. Like this was her form of consecration. Like when we say we're going to give our time and talents to the Lord, that is exactly what she did. Like 
her painting wasn't just beautiful and it wasn't just skilled and it wasn't just paint on canvas. It was a piece of her soul consecrated to the God she loved. And, um, and when I grew up in the Montpelier Tabernacle, there were two other paintings by her, which I believe are different paintings. Um, but I think, I think the story that I'm telling also applies to the Montpelier Tabernacle and they were beautiful and they're not there anymore. Um, I believe they're BYU now. Anyway, uh, so Tycart is asked to uh, do the to do a new mural at the Manti Temple. So the the Manti Temple is one of the first temples, uh, the fifth constructed finished, and by construction we mean finished temple in that the church made. So there's let's see if I can do this: Kirtland, and then Nabu, mm -hmm. and then Saint George, Logan, and Manti. I think that's right. So it is the the fifth one, and it is um, one of the oldest temples that's still running, and it has had to be shut down and renovated more than once. And in the 20s, one of the things that happened was um, some of the old uh, old murals, which were done directly on the plaster, were damaged and couldn't be saved. But unlike what they just did in Salt Lake where they tore them out, um, what they did was they put sail canvas over the walls and then had new painters paint over them. So um, I don't know who Minerva painted over. She, uh, her room is the world room, um, but uh, Dan Wegeland's uh, paintings were covered over by paintings by a guy named Robert Shepard um, who painted around the same time Minerva Tykart did. So Minerva's are the most famous because she's the most beloved painter in the church. But there, there are these other great paintings in the temple too, and in other other temples as well. Like I love the paintings in the LA temple, for instance. And um, I only saw the paintings in the Salt Lake Temple once, but I'm very sad they're gone. A lot of newer temples um, have some paintings. They, they they made a real effort to make the paintings in Nauvoo, uh, in the Nauvoo Temple, quite lovely. They had great artists do them. So I mean, I'm I'm paging through her art right now. I'm I'm really struck by the Queen Queen Esther painting. Oh, that's one of my favorites. It's really really good. And then Christ in the red robe, I think, is the one you mentioned earlier, with the women reaching up to her, uh, reaching up to Christ. That is a classic one. Um, in fact, I would say of the people I know, <laughs> and this is a very like so. Here's the subset of people I know. The people I know who I know have spent a lot of time thinking about putting a painting of Jesus in their house and like agonizing over the best possible one. All of those people who really agonized over the choice went with Christ in the red rope. Okay. And like I said, that's not a huge number of people <laughs> that I'm privy to their process and how difficult it was. But those who agonize over it, that is what they arrive at at the end. And what was their reasoning? Um, I think, first of all, because it's it's beautiful. And, really um, and in a practical standpoint, it fits with almost any decor, but it's also a really striking painting. And if you're going to put something in your house, you have to look at for decades, perhaps you want something that's worth looking at for decades, perhaps. And that painting painting certainly is. If one was going to buy a print and hope to benefit some kind of estate or something, do you have a recommended way of doing that? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you asking like buying a print to make your house nicer? Is that what you're saying? But like it would like um, I don't want to buy it off like some random Etsy person. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Like where to buy it? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I am I am not certain about that. It's a fair question. I would love to hear back from any listeners who have opinions about who is the most uh, ethical person to buy Minerva Tykart prints from. I would love to know the answer to that question. <laughs> That's a pretty rabbit holy question. Yes. <laughs> so. Tell me a bit about um, more about the Manti Temple then. So my parents were married there. Um, I've never been. It is well, it is in the middle of nowhere, Aaron. Like, like you cannot be more in nowhere than Manti. Um, I mean, yes, you can. Monticello is more in the. There are places in Utah more in the middle of nowhere than Manti, but it is a hard, it is a hard, challenging thing to do to find someone more isolated than Manti. Although I understand that's changing, part of uh, President Nelson's announcement, which we'll get to later, talks about how Ephraim, which is nearby, is growing and, and the Snow College is growing. And so, uh, but anyway, uh, 
the temple is announced in 1875. The site is dedicated in 77. Um, it gets, you know, built and is finally dedicated in 1888 by Lorenzo Snow, still a few years away from the Salt Lake Temple being built, which took forever. Um, there are rumors that um, Brigham Young told someone that the this spot was dedicated by Moroni for a temple back when he was alive. But the evidence for that is not as good as I spent my whole life believing. <laughs> that <laughs> It wasn't recorded for a long time afterwards. I am now a super skeptical of that. I think we have to count it as an urban legend, but I still like the story. A nice faith promoting story. Yes, this is my favorite kind. <laughs> but the problem with nice faith promoting stories is when you learn they're not well documented, sometimes it has the opposite effect, <laughs> which I feel like might be something we've talked about on the show before. Indeed. Um, so like I was saying, it's been remodeled a few times. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the famous stone stairway, uh, that's not built until the early 20th century. Uh, they, they light the outside in 1935. I'm getting all this off, uh, off Wikipedia. In 1940, the stone stairs were removed and they started beautifying the grounds, whatever that means. Um, in the 40s, they redid a lot of the interior including the the newer um, the newer murals. Some of the old murals are still around, by the way. But in fact, I believe there's one, I want to say by uh, CC, CCA Christensen, CC Christensen, wait, CCA Christensen, right? Yeah, CCA Christensen, who's another interesting artist um, in church history, a pioneer era artist, like he was a pioneer and his in the, in the Manti Temple, I believe is the only pure pioneer era mural that still exists. Um, and is visible. Uh, like I said, some of them have been covered with canvas, but are technically still there. Um, really, and then, huh, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, looking at the exterior of it, it reminds me a lot of the Salt Lake City Temple, right? But also, it's in um, Logan in particular. Okay. But also, it has the kind of bell, I mean, they're kind of rounded structures. I want to say the Nauvoo Temple. Uh, um, the Nauvoo is a little bit like that, too. I mean, it looks a lot like Logan, but yeah, Nauvoo also has that sort of rounder um, peaks. It has some nice crenellations. Yes, it certainly does. <laughs> so you know, that means it's, that case, means it's, de uh, it's defensible. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can take your arrows and your boiling oil up there and you should be able to hold off the hordes for a while. <laughs> okay, so we've talked about, um, okay, so we've got this Manti Temple. We've got um, Minerva uh, Tekart, and we've got um, the murals. Now, it's actually quite difficult to find um, good pictures of the world room on, on ah, the internet. I will be able to hook you up with that. It's hard to find like nice, good panoramas. Lots of like, like they try to angle the shots, but if you have something good, that would be useful. So the best, the best available pictures that I know come from a uh, BYU studies article. We can provide that link to everyone. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about this problem, Aaron, mm -hmm. is that if something's in the temple, it's inherently less accessible. Um, when the outcry against taking the murals out first happened, uh, the church's first response was, we will do all we can to preserve them and put them on display somewhere else. Um, with the idea that if the murals are important to people, then people want to be able to see them. So like, what if we move them to Salt Lake and put them in the museum? That'll be better for everybody, right? And that's there's a logic to that. And it's better than just destroying them, obviously. But it's temple art and uh, the nature of the temple is that it is sacred. It is set apart from the world. It is um, special in a way that, that other art just as like other chairs or other carpet is not right. Um, and it's not because better people get to see it, but it's because it is consecrated and it is sacred by um, its purpose. The purpose of the murals is to direct the mind in the direction of what the endowment is teaching. And that gives it a, an importance that it loses if it's no longer in that sacred setting. And so, so ultimately what we have here is 
like I, there was one article on times and seasons that dismissed it as just like chemicals on on canvas and what does it matter but that's not what it is at all and i, I think that's a kind of grotesquely um anti joseph smith attitude where we believe where joseph smith taught that everything temporal is spiritual and i think the paintings of someone like minerva teichart are really clearly teaching that to us that um mundane touchable things can become spiritual and holy if we direct our spirit into them and make them holy and that's kind of i mean isn't that's kind of the whole idea behind an ordinance right like there's nothing inherently special about going under the water uh people do that all the time it's it's about the direction and the attention that we give to things and their purpose and the and the way that our attention connects those scenes to god that makes them important and sacred okay let's not bury the lead any longer they okay they were going to take these murals out as part of renovating and there was a big outcry and whether and you know depending on how you read the announcement um the outcry may or may not have had an effect but they're not going to do that anymore yeah i i've read a couple things um about this and it's obvious that the outcry had something to do with it they no one knew what their plan was until the salt lake ones were destroyed and then people started asking questions we found out that manti was also slated to just be ripped out um that led to people complaining that led to the church trying to find out what people thought about it which led to them not doing it and i think one thing that i've heard from a number of places and uh, most recently hey can i can i take a moment to plug that we are a proud member of the dialogue podcast network I think because i was listening to mormon news report on sunday and something they occasionally talk about is the idea of trickle up revelation mm -hmm. um of which as they mentioned the most famous example is the primary which did not come from the pr first presidency but started at the lower levels of the church and worked its way upward because it was a good idea and um i i feel like the current messaging from the top level of the church is like revelation was received and something only we have access to and the the announcement was really framed in a way as if they hadn't done all this research and found out how much people cared about these things and and i wish i don't like that framing because i don't think i don't think they lose anything by um being grateful that uh revelation can come from both directions and you know the membership of the church feeling strongly about something doesn't mean that the first presidency was like forced into it it can still be revelation i there, i wish the messaging had been different but the important thing is that the plans were changed and they were they're bringing in um conservation experts from europe to help preserve the paintings and that's a great thing um what's a world room ah okay so here's a fun thing um some temples and all earlier temples, I believe all temples before Switzerland, if I'm correct, this will come up actually in uh, our final episodes of David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism. Um, but early temples all had you proceed from place to place. There's uh, the creation room, the world room, the terrestrial room and the celestial room. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but anyway, you, you proceed from room to room. Um, nowadays, the way most temples work is you just sit in a room and watch the video and the video goes through those stages but you don't move physically when they read it when they remodeled the la temple a few years back i'm not sure how long it's probably 15 20 years ago now they went back to having you move from room to room which was great like it was still the video but it was great to go from room to room because all of a sudden the paintings were relevant um they made sense and also i i feel that the the physical act of moving from place to place, at least for me, helps me understand the atonement better for two reasons. First of all, the symbolic movement of, of, of like progressing through the rooms, I think is inherent to what the endowment is about. And second, ever since my MTV, my MTV, my MTC district, <laughs> that's a weird slip. Uh, <laughs> ever since my MTC district decided that we were gonna get up at like 5 a.m. and do our endowment, 
uh, our weekly endowment sessions at the Provo Temple. Ever since that terrible decision, <laughs> I have, have found it very difficult to get through the endowment without falling asleep because those <laughs> weeks in the MTC trained me to fall asleep <laughs> at the endowment. Um, so standing up and moving helps keep me a little more honest, I guess <laughs> we could say. Yeah, I've, I've definitely experienced the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my sessions in the, uh, for those that don't know, an endowment session in the church is like two hours, about an hour and a half long depending on getting shorter all the time it's getting shorter all the time depending on <laughs> what era you're in um so you yeah the art and i've done the salt lake i've done a live endowment mm -hmm. in the salt lake city and i'll buy it and it was and it was amazing so i remember vividly um so the difference between going to the temple now and seeing the video right all the actors are young and gorgeous right <laughs> If you don't yeah. mind me saying and it's really nice good production um and uh it's great when i went to the salt lake city it was these respectable old folks right yeah. portraying the role aprons on crooked yeah and but when they would say a line right they were so invested in what they were saying they yeah. it's not that the actors aren't in the video right but you've got this venerable old person saying this line that you've memorized because you've heard it so many and already means a lot to you and then you hear this this older fellow say it in a slightly different way and it changes the meaning and it was really cool so they're yeah. terribly inefficient and i don't mind them going away to be honest the live sessions it's fine that's not that's not i think what would what bothers me i i did agree i did not want to see the art go <laughs> and it was surprising when I first heard about it. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I had the same visceral reaction, though, that so many people I saw online had, right? Why, can yeah. you help me understand a bit? Like, so in the world room, what, you, what it is, is this is the room that represents the um, in-between time, right? Between the Garden of Eden and, you know, exiting 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 the, this life uh, exiting the world and moving into the into the terrestrial kingdom right yeah and so the way men i'm not on a first brain name basis with her the way minerva <laughs> tykart illustrated this was by having pageantry down the sides of it that's and right so she proceeding in time had it progressing through time right um and it is really cool uh, you've been there i have you've done this you've done this session yeah my parents took me to the manti temple as we drove to the mtc actually um and that might be the i think that's the only time i've done a live session so it's been a very long time um and i am actually kind of sad to see it go away i mean to have it in one corner of the world where hardly anybody gets to but now that, you know but on the other hand i really like I understand the logic behind the films and we will be talking about that in a later episode and I don't disagree with it, but it would be nice if like, I don't know, once a month or something, there was a live session Yeah, because it's so, it's so, it's such a different experience to do it with living people in the room with you. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, help me understand the art is good and I appreciated it. Right. But I don't have the same emotional reaction that I'm seeing from people online about preserving the art. So what are they doing? I, th I thought that they were going to leave it in the temple. Is that not the case? They are going to pull it out? Oh, no, they are now. Okay. Now they're going to leave it in the temple. Yes. Yeah, that's what but, I thought. But originally they were just going to knock it out. Um, and then, or at least that was the fear. Maybe that was never the original plan. And they were just, but they did do that in Salt Lake City. They just destroyed the stuff in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. So it's a little hard to be certain they wouldn't have. Um, and then they said, well, okay, well, you don't want us to destroy it. We'll take it out and put it in a museum or something. And now they're going to do all they can to preserve it and keep it in keep place. It there like in they did temple. in the 80s. Not that long ago, they restored everything. Um, anyway, so... Why, so why is this particular art so meaningful to these, so to enough people online to cause a, cause a kerfuffle? Yeah, so I think there are, there are a number of reasons. Um, one of them is that... Well, I want to leave Minerva for last, but I think the fact that it's her is really important to understanding what's happening here. Um, but in a more general sense, like, first of all, the art is really great. And it is ex 
excruciatingly Latter-day Saint in its in its nature, uh, both in its purpose and in its um, provenance and in its execution and in its its it just everything about it is very Latter-day Saint. And so there's so few things like that. There just aren't a lot of things in our culture that have been around a long time and are beautiful and are meaningful and that we all can agree are good. We just don't have a lot of stuff like that. Um, there is a lot of stuff that's good, but good stuff that people are aware of and care about and haven't forgotten, just not a lot of that stuff. So there's that. Um, there's also the fact that for people for whom the Bantai Temple is important, um, that art has become just a part of their soul. There was a good article I forget if it was in Times and Season or by Common Consent. I'm sure we'll include all these in the show notes. But there was a good one who talked about how the nature of doing holy, sacred work um, makes the stuff you are with when you're doing that holy, sacred work also holy and sacred and part of your experience, part of your connection to God. And so the paintings have done this. They've become part of people's meditative, spiritual reality. Um, of course, that's a minor subset, not hardly, you know, most members of the church will never go to Manti. Um, and then we get to Minerva Teichart herself. Um, like I said, she is significant um, to us as a people in terms of the excellence of her artistry. Uh, there's also the fact that um, uh, not all of her work has survived. A good percentage of it has, but not all of it. There's also the fact that this is the largest, most um, epic stuff that she did and there is and this is this can't be turned into like a trite thing but there's the important fact that she is a woman um and there have not been that many we don't we just don't have enough stories in the church of latter-day saint women who've had the opportunity to rise to the very top of what they do and have it be appreciated and accepted by the church um, speaking of the Dialogue Podcast Network, we recently added a new show called um, At Last She Said It. And so I listened to their most recent episode yesterday, and it was about modesty. So so kind of a not an obvious connection to what we're talking about now. But as I understand it, one of the themes of the show, and certainly something I could hear in, in that episode, was this need for women in the church to feel fully recognized and fully appreciated and fully incorporated into the body of Christ, which we as a people have not, we're great at saying we do it, but we're not always great at actually making women feel that way. And Minerva is one of the people that many Latter-day Saint women can look to and say, we belong, like we belong to the church that produced Minerva Teichart. Um, Look at what she's done. And for the church to say, we're just going to throw out her most important accomplishment, um, felt like not just an attack on beautiful art and not just an attack on Minerva Teichart, but a, an attack on the entire female population of the church to a lot of women. Um, she, she has important symbolic weight, Minerva does, to uh, many women in the church who appreciate her and admire her and um, see her as, as um, a role model of how a Latter-day Saint woman can be fully herself and fully accepted and um, beloved by the church as a whole. I was going to talk about just art in general, right? Because I did want to bring up the point counterpoint series. Yeah, that sure. You mentioned that was on times and seasons. It was in times and what and times and seasons is. It is a it is a one and one of the good old members of the of the blogger knackle, which is a still still surviving in a few small bits. Part of the Mormon web, in other words. Yes. Um, so the point counterpoint was like just two of on the subject was just two articles. One article, one article saying it doesn't really matter that these are going away, and the other article saying it really does matter. Um, it felt so like such an obvious. The one that was published that says that it doesn't matter felt like such an obvious straw man to me. Yeah, <laughs> it really did. It's like, um, I, I, I know people are upset about this and uh, I am a gentleman and I don't usually just troll people and um, art is stupid. So this is my big chance to, that's kind of how it felt to me too. 
uh-huh. and it got all the responses he wanted. I, I almost have to wonder if he intentionally made the argument so irritating <laughs> to to guarantee that all the great articles that were written in response to it were written. Uh huh. Well, that's kind of what I was wondering. I don't know that we can give whoever this is that much credit. Maybe they, maybe they do, but um. I forget who wrote it, but if I remember correctly, I don't know the person. So. Okay. Well, whatever. The article was written. One of the points it made was um, that, be, you know, Moses destroyed the, not Moses, um, the Moses who made, you know, held up the serpent, right? Mm-hmm. And the uh, people looked up to it and were saved from the, uh, from the venom of the snakes. And this is an yeah. Old Testament story, right? But later, one of the kings of Israel or Judah um, destroyed it because it was becoming something that was being worshipped, right? The argument yeah. was that art doesn't matter. It's just a thing. Who cares? All right, I've set up the straw man for you, Eric. Take a shot at it. Well, I just find that argument flabbergasting. Like, I have no words. Like... As far as I know, there is no cult of Minerva out there. Uh, you know, like people don't come to the temple to worship at her altar. Like that, that's never what the art has been. And it's never what anyone has said the art is. Okay, so that's fine. You killed it. That's great. Yeah. I want to talk about Catholicism now. I, oh, okay. And icons. Yeah. Okay. Can we do that? Can I hijack the... Um, uh, the conversation a bit sure okay icons again we're going to just keep using wikipedia because it's amazing they are not simply artworks an icon is a sacred image used in religious devotion the most common subjects include christ mary saints and angels although especially associated with portrait style images concerning one or two main figures the term also covers most religious images in a variety of artistic media produced by eastern christianity including narrative scenes usually from the Bible or from the lives of saints. Yeah. And um, I don't know, but I think they're awesome. <laughs> they're beautiful. Yeah. And they're fascinating. <laughs> and sometimes they're weirdly alien in marvelous ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish we had a Catholic on the podcast and we could just ask them how they feel about I- I- icons. I would be really interested in hearing that answer, but I will, if I can say something real fast, like the sort of anti-papist, thing about Catholics are idolaters is just so inherently unfair and just Mm -hmm. obvious nonsense. Like, I don't know any Catholic who, um, as they cross themselves, as they look at, you know, an icon or whatever, like none of them are confusing the icon with God, right? No, that is, that's not something like maybe, I guess maybe some really simple minded person does, but, but that's not, Catholics aren't confusing this object of devotion with god um it's an unfair thing to say and i i do wonder you know we still don't have crosses on our buildings and the reason we didn't in the first place well i I mean one of the reasons we didn't in the first place is that uh no american church had crosses on their buildings at the time because that was a catholic thing to do and we all hated catholics and we didn't want to be confused as catholics so protestants have slowly readopted that and uh, we are allergic to it because we don't want to be seen as um, either Catholic or Protestant. But I, I think one of the side effects of, of us maintaining this sort of Puritan low church sense of artless worship is that um, something like the mural fiasco can happen because th- there's some feeling deep in our hearts that the right thing to do is to take all things, no matter how sacred or beautiful and are important and prove they are not sacred and beautiful and important by ignoring or destroying or forgetting about them. I love what you said. I love what you said about, I think you're welcome, about how (laughs) Catholics obviously don't, um, you know, believe in what, in just worshiping these, these icons, right? And the reason why this all came to mind was because of one of the articles you sent me before the show by common consent is the website the article is ritual remembrance and minerva tykart's art um, by russell abin fox okay and here's the and here's the quote that i really liked from this article on this subject right 
And it's talking about remembrance, right? One of the whole purposes behind all of the ritual of the temple and of the sacrament and of church worship in general is remembrance, right? And it's because we're just, because we're just, it's so easy to forget things, right? The words of the sacrament of prayer, you know, say, you do always remember him. And so these, the, these rituals are designed to keep us so remembering. Okay, so here's this quote. Jim Falconer, a professor of philosophy at BYU, and probably the finest scriptarium I've ever had the pleasure to know, has written insightfully about the role of remembrance in our religious understanding multiple times, and often those writings come back to the place of ritual in Mormon life. No, Mormon Christianity does not and probably never could make space of the orthodox attachment to icons, which they see as visibly reflecting God's grace, nor the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist, which they accept as literally presenting Jesus's atoning sacrifice in the communion wafer. But we are nonetheless embodied creatures. And as such, the environment, the material circumstances of the rituals we participate in and attach to and work upon us through all that surrounds them. As you wrote in this powerful essay, Remembrance, and I'm not gonna read the whole, read what he talks about, but this person, um, Jim Falconer, describes his wedding ring um, and how powerful of uh, remembrance of it is for his wife, right? He doesn't see his wife in the ring and it, 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 he doesn't conflate the two, I mean, but it, it's a remembrance. <laughs> Right? You need to see a doctor if you're confusing <laughs> yes, your wife the, and a ring. The man who, th who thought his wife was a hat is a great book. That's exactly what I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I understood that reference. Um, <laughs> so remembrance, right? And so that's, I think, if you grew up around in that area, I can totally see how much the, that particular uh, that that art would be core to you remembering your ritual about the church. Um, our churches are very Spartan, though, aren't they? Pretty, yeah, and uh, not as and, much as you know, people I was, were sometimes accused of. Like sure, I, and I would disagree. And that, with there's that a, a beauty to that as well. Um, there's a sister in our ward, grew up in our ward, no less. And um, there's some stenciling in the front of our chapel, which is quite lovely. Uh, it's not representational, it's just, you know, patterns. But the patterns make this, in the corners, they, they make this little shape, which with a, with a tiny bit of imagination looks like carrots. And she talks about like growing up and like looking at those. And, um, and she knew the man who had painted them uh, was a non-member father of another woman, of another girl in the ward. And when she went away to school and then eventually returned, she just always felt the church was truer where there's carrots in the corners. <laughs> and that's not like, it's not really easy to compare those to Minerva Teichart's paintings, but it was, it was a focus of her church experience. And it's something that has lasted her entire life. She's, she's not as young as she used to be. And yeah. Like these things give us focus and they matter. And, you know, the fact that we don't believe that the, the bread literally becomes the, the body of Jesus, that should emphasize to us when we think about our practice that we are very much engaged in symbols and using symbols to access God. And that's all art is, if you want to oversimplify it. Quoting again from the article, I freely admit that none of the above makes any kind of specific case for the actually presently existing art at Manti. Take away those murals, and human beings still will find some other meaning-making art to attend to their temple rituals, as they do for every and any other ritual and worshipful act, wherever or however performed. So what's the real loss, then? Simply that in Manti, many decades ago, a pious artist named Minerva Teichart creatively imagined a crowded wealth 
of possible remembrance-inducing connections, which those moving through that sacred space could discover. And as the testimony of many over the past couple of weeks has made clear, that remembrance has worked really well. I would like to see it myself, and I guess now I'll get the chance to someday. Yeah, it's a nice little trip in the middle, to the middle of nowhere. You'll get to see lots of turkey farms. So that's something to look forward to. <laughs> uh, do we want to talk a bit about um, activism? Because I think that's an interesting subject oh, response to this um, as part of this topic. Yeah, I, I, I think that there is room in the church for activism, but because it's not formalized in any way, it's not clear what works and what's effective. Um, yeah, I, I, it's tricky. I mean, I know right now, for instance, that uh, this has been written about by, I think, Jenna Rice and Peggy Fletcher Sack, but there, there's a survey going out to a lot of single adults in the church trying to ascertain their attitudes about things and their feelings about church. And the kinds of questions they're asking um, suggest that the church is open to some pretty radical changes in terms of how um, what church will look like in the future. And so, I mean, but really activism can only work as well as leaders are humble enough to hear what people have to say. And well, because I, I kind of hate the word activism because in a, in a church that, as we have discussed in the David O. McKay sessions is so uh, enthralled to certain mid-century conservative ideas, Activism somehow sounds like communism, which somehow sounds like Satanism. And so I'm not sure that's the right word, but um, I think there has to be ways for leaders to listen to the people and hear ideas coming from the beginning. I mean, think about, uh, uh, I mean, Moses, you brought up Moses, um, the daughters of Zelophehad, they had a problem and they're like, this isn't fair. All our father's dead. So we're going to get, we're not going to get an inheritance. Like, what are we supposed to do? And they went and talked to Moses and Moses said, you're right. That's not fair. We're going to, we're going to fix that for you. Moses wasn't thinking about these four women and um, that there's room in the church for people at the bottom to express their needs and be heard. And for the leaders at the top to um, make space for that. Because if we learn anything from Jesus, he likes the people on the bottom and he wants to meet their needs. It's interesting the language that you chose, top versus bottom. Yeah, I hate that term, and I hate the metaphor. And you know, I, I have I have a lot of uh, I've probably spoken more bad things about J. Reuben Clark over this season than positive things. So here's the nice thing about J. Reuben Clark: when President McKay became the president of the church, he demoted in quotation marks J. Reuben Clark to from first counselor to second counselor. And that had never happened before. And people are like, oh, he must be really offended. And he gave a talk in general conference saying it doesn't matter where you serve, how you serve, or something like that. And we often give lip service to that, right? That there's no difference between being a bishop or working in the nursery. But our behavior and the way we talk about things doesn't really reflect that. Um, we do seem to accept some people's callings as more important than others, and some people's sacrifices and services as more meaningful than others. Um, one of the most heart-touching things I read in relation to the murals was Artist Parshall's um, uh, article that she wrote on Keep Pitching In uh, about a time when she... Actually, can I just read a few paragraphs? I'll, I'll read the beginning of her essay. A few years ago, she writes, in the ward where I now live, a man in my Sunday school class died. When the Relief Society arranged for the usual post-funeral luncheon, I signed up to bring cake. Very early on the morning of the funeral, I baked two cakes from scratch from my two favorite recipes with, for me, expensive ingredients, including a lot of maraschino cherries. I wrapped them and carried them on foot down to the chapel on my way down the hill to the church history library. When I took them into the kitchen, I was instantly humiliated. Unknown to me, but obviously known to every other sister who had brought food, my ward no longer wanted homemade goodies. Everyone else knew to bring identical six foot long Subway sandwiches and identical sugar and shortening sheet cakes from Smith's. I dropped my unwanted effort into a trash can and fled. I have never dared volunteer for a ward food assignment again. Strangely, 
that reminded me of what seemed like a totally unrelated event from many years earlier when I was in my 20s. Before my eyesight failed, I used to crochet less exquisite, or sorry, I used to crochet lace, exquisite lace, like most of you have never seen. My preferred hook size was 16, a tiny size that had to be custom ordered. My favorite thread size was 150, a size finer than sewing thread that DMC no longer makes. I still have a stash built from scavenging Heinzelmans in Provo and buying a few balls here and there on eBay from sellers cleaning out their mother's stashes. My work was neat and careful and favored antique patterns. My usual bridal gift to girls I had known in Mutual was a dresser scarf with roses and scrolls and the name of the bride and groom crocheted right into the pattern. My work was good. As far back as I can remember, I had wanted to crochet an altar cloth for a temple, the finest work I could do for the holiest place I knew. And so sometime in the 1980s, I called the temple department in Salt Lake to ask about that. What I wanted to know was the dimensions of such cloth and whether there were guidelines about pictorial elements where flowers and leaves and birds encouraged or discouraged. I wasn't asking them to commission it or to guarantee acceptance. I just wanted to know the basics so that I could offer the best workmanship of my hands for the temple, just like our pioneer ancestors did, just like the workmen had done in the temples, at least as far back as Moses's tabernacle. The people I talked to in the temple department were brusque. They refused to answer my questions about dimensions or designs. I don't remember any statements to the quote, but they let me know in no uncertain terms that they did not need or want my efforts. I was crushed. For someone who is bold online, I'm easily crushed when I offer my heart and it is rejected. I never approach the church about anything like that again. It's a heartbreaking story. I read that as well. Um, I don't know how, I don't have a response. Except No, that, it's impossible to respond to. <laughs> except that it's a good word of warning, I suppose. When you find yourself in those leadership positions, you know, pay attention to what's happening around you and don't get so locked in to tradition and regulations that you miss what's happening. The church is a local church um, and it really thrives on the goodness of its members, right? Yeah. And you know, Jesus accepted, th said the two mites were worth more than what the rich people gave. And I think that's a very easy theme for us to forget. We're talking about like the, the murals are a grand and astonishing um, gift that someone gave. But in the eyes of God, it's really not worth more than, than a smaller gift. And we all need to be a bit more like our heavenly parents and accept the small gifts as just as meaningful because just because they might seem small to our limited perception does not mean they are small at all.